are you? I'm very well, thank you, no, very well. You are an infectious diseases expert who has advised six presidents on everything from SARS to Ebola to the HIV uh, epidemic and Zika. What makes coronavirus so different? Well, it's different because, you know, when people used to ask me over the years, what is it that I most worry about with regard to emerging infectious diseases is a respiratory born illness that easily spreads from person to person, mm -hmm. but that has a high degree of morbidity and mortality. And unfortunately, that's the worst nightmare you could have is to have something like that. I mean, there are other diseases. Ebola was frightening, but Ebola gets transmitted only when you're in very close contact with a person who is very, very ill. With this disease, in some respects similar to influenza, but in some respects very different, it spreads very easily. You can right, even right. spread it when you're not symptomatic. So it's insidious and treacherous in that you could spread it easily. The other part about it that's really so different from anything that we've ever faced before is that if you look at the mortality of seasonal flu, the thing that you and I go through every season, mm -hmm. the mortality is about 0.1%. That's a lot. And we get used to that morbidity and mortality. But right. the mortality of this is about 10 times that. It's at least 1%. So it's, it, it's a disease that not only is easily spread, but it can be devastating, particularly for a certain subset of the population. Demographically different. The elderly, those with underlying conditions, heart disease, mm -hmm. lung disease, mm -hmm. diabetes. It can be very serious for them with a high degree of mortality. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the information in and around corona that's, that's, I think, getting people confused. I, I see so many conflicting ideas online and I guess the, the, the horrible byproduct of having social media and the internet is everyone is now an expert and everyone has an opinion. I know this is very basic for you, but just to help everyone be on the same page, how can we catch corona and what are the areas we should be most concerned about? So we know about human to human transmission. Most people understand that, but I see people online worried about grocery shopping, touching packages that they receive from Amazon. Do people need to wipe them down? When they're in the grocery store, can they touch other things? How long does coronavirus last in the air? For instance, if you walk into an elevator after somebody else, can coronavirus still be there? What do we need to be on the lookout for as individuals? Okay, there's varied degrees of risk, Trevor, of that in, in every respect. But the things that are the most common that you really want to latch on to is that sneezing and coughing. When someone is ill, they've got to get themselves out of circulation because they can spread by droplets and even by what we call aerosol, which means the drop doesn't go down right away. It hangs around for a bit. So wow. you can come into a room thinking everything is all right, and then you inhale it. That's likely not the primary way. The primary way is probably droplet. But another way that's very important is handshaking. When people naturally go <clears throat> like that, they cough, and then it's innocent. There's nothing on their hand. They shake your hand or they open a doorknob. And that's the thing. You don't want to be obsessive compulsive about wiping everything down that you go near. But one of the real bad actors is somebody who just opens a door and then 15 minutes later, because we know the virus can live on inanimate hard objects like steel or plastic right. for at least several hours. So that's the thing you've got to be careful of. That's one of the reasons why, if you really want to be careful, besides the social distancing of six right. feet, don't shake anybody's hands. Just lose that for a while. And wash your hands as often as you can because you may be inadvertently touching something. Got now, it. your Got other it. question, Trevor, that's important, is that I don't think we need to get completely obsessed about packages that come in because those types of surfaces, the virus might live there for a very short time, but people say, should I, should I get a package from a grocery store that says made in China? I, I wouldn't worry about that. That's not the issue. It's more the close things, the hand washing. Let's talk a little bit about what you alluded to earlier, the, the mortality rates of the disease and how people have misconstrued the numbers. We know that people who are older or people who have underlying respiratory infections um, have a higher chance of dying from the virus. But I think people have started to believe that that means young people are immune and cannot get sick from coronavirus. What are people not understanding from the numbers? Trevor, they're not understanding two things that are important. A, even though you are young, 
you are not absolutely invulnerable, for sure, because we're seeing cases, most of them have some underlying disease, but several don't, who are young people, 30s, 40s, who are getting sick, getting into the hospital, requiring intensive care. Still, the overwhelming proportion are the elderly with underlying disease. But every once in a while, you're going to get a young person. So if you think you're completely invulnerable, you're incorrect. Second issue that's important, that even though you may not get seriously ill, you can get infected with relatively few symptoms, either asymptomatic or mild, relatively trivial symptoms. But then you can infect another person who would then infect a vulnerable person who would then die. I mean, it's a typical example. I'm young, I'm healthy, but you go home, you infect grandma, grandpa, and your sick uncle. So you have a responsibility, not only to protect yourself, but you almost have a societal moral responsibility to protect other people. In, in talking about the virus, it, it feels like, understandably, everyone is trying to find an answer. Everybody is trying to find their own solution. Unfortunately, that has bred, uh, you know, it's created a breeding ground for misinformation. For instance, uh, cures that people are touting online, uh, you know, concoctions of, of different medications, etc. We read about malaria drugs and, and chloroquine or, or whatever it is. What is the biggest warning you would give to the general public about trying to self-medicate or, or is there any cure that people actually have discovered? What, as, as a leading health expert, what do you say about this issue? So right now, today, as we speak, there is no proven safe and effective direct therapy for coronavirus disease, for sure. Oh, there are a number of clinical trials that are trying to, by randomized controlled trials, get a definitive answer as to what works and what does work, not work, what's safe, what's not safe. Superimposed upon that, there are drugs that are already approved for other things, like hydroxychloroquine for malaria and for certain autoimmune diseases, that there have been anecdotal stories. By anecdotal, I mean people kind of think they work, but they haven't really proven they work. That's really gotten out there on the Internet So people are very enthusiastic since generally these drugs appear to be safe, and they are, but they do have some toxicities. So a lot of people want a drug even though it's not proven, just Mm -hmm. in case it might help them. you got to be careful about that for a couple of reasons. You don't want to take that drug off the market for the people who really need it, who have the diseases it's used for. And on the other hand, there may be some toxicity. That's the reason why we're pushing to try and get as many good clinical trials as possible to prove if it works. If it does, then get it out there really fast for everybody. Got it. I have four questions because I know we're going to run out of time, but I just want to let you know I have four questions that I think are really important. Um, Number one, we hear about this clock, 15 days where things will be reassessed, 15 days where people might go back, 15 days, every country, 21 days. There seems to be a clock. My question is, what is that clock supposed to be and... Is there a certain amount of time that people can be away from each other where coronavirus goes away? And, and the follow-up in that same question is, does the clock start if people are not completely quarantined during that period? Yeah, the virus is the clock, uh, Trevor. So people say may arbitrarily, well, in two weeks, we're going to be okay. It depends on the kinetics of the outbreak. Right now, take New York City. They are getting hit really hard. And the Mm -hmm. kinetics of the outbreak is going there. You can't predict when it'll make that turnaround and start coming down. In general, if you look historically at, at countries that have been through the whole cycle, in China, it was about eight weeks or so before it went way up and then way down. In Korea, the same thing. So if you look at each individual country, and being a big country as we are here in the United States, We're almost like a lot of little countries, like New York in itself can be considered a country. California can be considered a country. So it's unpredictable about when you can say this cycle. It's usually measured in several weeks. Sometimes when you're into the cycle, you may only be two to three weeks away before it starts to turn around. Right. Okay. So then to that point, that's then my second of the four questions. Second question is, is New York City really harder hit? Or is New York's testing making the numbers spike up? And is this something that we're going to see start trending throughout America? 
Well, there are a couple of good questions right in there. New York is more hardly hit for sure. The nature of the city, the crowding of the city, the fact that you get the beginning of your outbreak when you get influx from other countries. China was the index country that came in. New uh-huh. York is a travel hub of the country. So clearly we had a lot of cases come in. By the time they realized what they were dealing with, they had already gotten a sucker punch. And they uh-huh. really were, were, were playing catch up. They didn't do anything wrong. They're not very different except that they're a big, robust city. And because of that, they're getting hit hard. Okay. And then the second last question is with regards to reinfection and immunity. We talk about people who have it and are asymptomatic. We talk about people who are recovering and we're starting to see those numbers grow around the world. Do we know yet if getting corona and surviving corona means that you're now immune to the disease or is there a chance of reinfection? Uh, We don't know that for 100% certain because we haven't done the study to see re-challenges, whether they've been protected. But I feel really confident that if this virus acts like every other virus that we know, Mm -hmm. once you get infected, get better, clear the virus, that you'll have immunity that will protect you against reinfection. So it's never 100%, but I'd be willing to bet anything that people who recover are really protected against reinfection. Okay, and then our final question, and thank you so much for your time. I really, I really hope everyone understands how important it is to listen to you. Final question with regards to the government, the CDC, the NIH, and all of the units working together. Right now, it feels like there is a, a, a push and pull, a tug of war between states and the federal government, etc. For Americans who are out there watching this, what is the plan, and what do you think needs to happen for the whole unit of the United States to fight the coronavirus, you know, implementing different checks and balances along the way to make sure that everyone fights it and the numbers go down? Well, that's a very good question. Things are implemented at the state and local level. That's the way this country works so well. The federal government is a facilitator, it's a supplier, it's a supporter. And that's the way things should be going. And that's what we're starting to see now as we are catching up on things that weren't done so well in the beginning. We now have many, many more tests. The private industry is getting involved. The government's not making the test. The private industry is. The ventilators that are needed coming out of the the stockpile, yet companies are starting to make more. So it really is a marriage between the federal government as the facilitator and supporter of where the real action is, is at the state and local level. Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. Um, You've been amazing. I could talk to you for an hour on this, but I know everyone wants your time. Good luck with what you're doing. And um, I hope we're doing our part to make your job a little bit easier. Thank you. You are very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Stay safe and wash your hands because of that fake cough you did. (laughs) Take care.